Meet Jeremy England, thermodynamicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Jeremy is probably best known for this paper on the statistical physics of self-replication. Somehow the idea is presented that if you have a chemistry out of equilibrium, that life just emerges from that situation. And this is described in this paper. I sat down with him in his office at MIT and we discussed the question, are we alone? Based on your research into what life is and how mm -hmm. life acts, is, is, is your studies leading to, or your research leading to increase the probability that there will be life on a planet around Alpha Zen B or decreasing them, or is it still agnostic and you can't say anything? Aren't you, are, aren't you making progress toward trying to answer the question, should we expect life elsewhere? I, in narrow terms, think what I can say about our research is that it's focused on the question of what are the physical conditions that are required or conducive for the emergence of different kinds of life-like behaviors from settings in which they're initially absent. And I think the more so that we refine our understanding of those aspects into physics, the more when we pose a question about what there is out there in the rest of the universe, we will have more to put in the blank space of, of, of what we're you know, trying to fill with our imagination. Because I think that you know, when we try to make these calculations about what's out there, there always are these X factors we don't know. But sometimes, in addition, there are some somewhat naive kind of gut feelings that we have about the difficulty of producing certain kinds of behavior. So for example, you know, if I find a pine cone on the ground, I don't wonder where, how it got to the ground, given that it was initially on a tree, because I know that there's gravity and sometimes things fall. And so there's a tendency from the physics to end up on the ground you know, if you break off the tree. And, and so we, we've refined our understanding of physics further, because in the 19th and 20th century, what we figured out is the formation of crystals, which might have initially seemed really challenging and, and, and difficult because you're ordering in this incredibly intricate way a lot of different atoms in this regular lattice, that turns out to, in another sense, also be like a ball rolling down a hill. Do you have a role for gods in this evolution? Well, I, I mean, I think my own understanding is certainly specifically filtered through um, the you know, texts of the Jewish tradition, so the Hebrew Bible and, and the uh, writings and sayings of the Talmudic sages, et cetera. Uh, and through that lens, I don't see such a tension because I think that uh, there's really uh, a lot of room to resolve these issues by viewing it in terms of, again, the language that we're currently speaking in the way that we talk about things. So uh, the, the, there uh, is a language for talking about the world in which what we're oriented towards is questions like, how should I act? Or uh, what meaning should I see in the events that occur in my life? Or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, that is the goal, let's say, of the Hebrew Bible, to uh, provide a taxonomy and a, and a narrative and a legal system for uh, what the world is uh, with the goal of enabling uh, the Israelite nation to have some way of arguing with each other about no, what they should any, be doing. Does that right? have anything to do with the origin of life? Well, it obviously... Uh, it does have to do with, you know, the text concerns itself uh, with the origin of life, but again, it's a different kind of origin that it's talking about. It's not talking about an origin in the language of physics or in the language of biology. It's talking about uh, it in, in terms that are relevant to the mission, right? And the, the mission that uh, this document concerns itself with has to do with uh, social order and, and national identity and all of these things which you know, they, the vocabulary you need for that is birds and men and women and fish and light right, and dark right, and all right, those things. Right. You, you don't need DNA and electrons first in right. order to deal with those issues, right? So I, I think that um, I don't see any uh, conflict there, both in terms of, I, I don't think that the, the texts of, of that tradition or of the tradition that I'm a part of um, are seeking to replace or supplant or exclude scientific reasoning as a, as a way of knowing things about the world. Um, but I, I think that it just understands, in my view correctly, that 
there's a broader set of questions that we're trying to talk about. So advice for students who want to look into this question and want to become, let's say, astrobiologist? Um, I think that, uh, to me, the thing that perhaps, you know, I hope will increasingly be part of the discussion in all of this, uh, and which we're really working away at right now, and which I think hopefully is an interesting idea for people to start carrying around with them as they try to address these issues, um, is, is to think about when you're trying to understand uh, a, a, a living thing, or even not a living thing, but a physical system, uh, rather than relying on sort of gut intuitions for what something is capable of when it's randomly slapped together, remember that the typical case is rather that something, uh, any material system, is a collection of matter that has a history, and that it has a history that bears the mark of the environment in which it has dynamically evolved over time.